Well, hello, hello, hello. I think we're live. Gray beard. <laughs> That's like always the first comment. Right, right. Yeah, from, from either Ben or, or Matt or David or somebody or maybe Mark. Yeah. <laughs> the usual <Gray> suspects. beard. <laughs> the usual suspects. And then uh, Gary from Indiana will, will definitely comment here in just a moment. I'm sure of that. <laughs> right? Isn't it always Gary that says, hi, Gary from Indiana? Yep. It's good to see like, the normal people logging in. It's kind of cool. Hey, Tony. Sorry, a little delayed today. <clears throat> Had to sort through some tech issues and other stuff and interruptions. Uh oh, and we lost Matthew. So more tech issues. Thought we got that sorted out. So as you can see, here we go. Here we go. Here he, he's back. Yeah, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> Got it, got it. <laughs> I moved over to the comments so I could see the comments. I click log in and then they lock me out or whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just saying how we had some tech issues to sort yeah. through, and then like you disappeared. I'm like, point proven. <laughs> that wasn't tech, that was mental bandwidth. That was, that was Graybeard operating a machine that he's not qualified to. <laughs> what does this do? <laughs> well hello cammy charlie mark thanks for joining uh today is an industry news and gear reviews episode so that means we're going to talk about uh industry news and then we're going to share with you some of our latest products that we'd like to review so uh i'm excited about mine are you excited about yours matthew yeah absolutely um yeah, for sure. I think it'll be cool. And Lloyd from Texas says he's he says you've one new viewer from Texas. Awesome. Thank you for being with us today, Lloyd. Well, I'm surprised it took this long, but finally there's a gray beard comment. Hey David. <laughs> um Tony does need guidance on setting the clock on his VCR. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, I do. It's a beta. Hello, Max. Jeff hello, Jefferson Martial Arts on YouTube. Says he stopped carrying his Springfield Hellcat. Started carrying the Springfield XDM 10 millimeter. <laughs> well, that's a bit of a difference in power. <laughs> <laughs> I've shot those uh those XDM 10 millimeters. Uh I mean it's not like it's any different than a Glock 10 millimeter, which I've also shot, or revolver chambered in 10 millimeter, which I've also shot. Uh, you know, they got they got they punch a punch a pretty good or pack a pretty good punch. There we go. <laughs> they punch a pack or pack a punch. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're gonna kick it off here and do the recorded portion of the, sh of the audio show. Uh, for those of you that are that are new, of course, Lloyd here, uh, uh, who just told us he's a new uh, viewer of the podcast. Uh, the podcast has existed in some form or another for over four years, uh, and first and foremost, as a as an audio podcast found on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and other podcast player services that you can find all over the place. Uh, we try to make sure, I mean, we're on Spotify as well. Uh, so anywhere that you would typically think of or go to for a podcast, uh, there's a, probably a few exceptions, but pretty much all of the major players, uh, the Concealed Carry podcast is out there. So uh, if you don't, if you're not able to catch the live video show, uh, which is literally just us doing the show live, recording, the audio then for the podcast feed, well, you can always go to the podcast feed and an easy way to get to the latest podcast episodes is just going to podcast.concealedcarry.com. So uh, let's kick it off, Matthew. You ready? I'm always ready, man. Here we go in three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, episode number 415. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network. I am your host, Riley Bowman, 
And I'm joined today by, as some in the viewer chat are calling him, Dirty Snowbeard. Yes, yes. Good, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Dirty Snowbeard. Uh, this is going to be cool. Uh, we had an exciting episode last week, and I think this will be fun, too. Absolutely. Now, in case people don't recognize the voice, you know, just like they may not recognize the face, <laughs> uh, it's Matthew Marister you're hearing. <laughs> So yeah, you can't I, get rid of me, man. <laughs> I agree with you about last week's episode. Uh, you know, I, I have, and you know this. You and I have chatted offline. Uh, I have gone back and forth and back and forth as as to whether, you know, we we should have even uh, discussed the topic, and that was, of course, the the shooting in Georgia of uh, Ahmad Arbery. And uh, you know, as I've had the opportunity to reflect on it, Matthew, I come back to the lessons to be learned from the shooting. And that's what I want people, that's what I want to stick with people in their minds, right? Mm -hmm. Regardless of the legal issues, uh, because those are going to have to play out, right? And that's what's going on. I mean, charges were filed. These two guys were arrested. They're sitting behind bars for right now. Uh, There's going to be a lot more legal stuff you know it's got to happen and take place uh investigation being done uh attorneys getting involved discovery you know interviews all kinds of stuff's got to happen so um and then maybe eventually a trial right so uh, we'll we'll see how that goes but the lessons to be learned is don't go looking for trouble that's yeah, universal right, right? Be- because even if those guys were justified in doing what they did. And that's for the, that's for the courts to figure out and for them to decide if they were justified in doing what they did. I'll bet you they look back at it now. Well, I could be wrong in this, but I think most normal people would be sitting in a situation like those guys are in right now and go, I wish I had not grabbed my gun and gone out the door Mm -hmm. in the first place, because you'd much rather avoid this trouble in the first place, you'd much rather go to sleep tonight and go, I didn't have to shoot somebody. This all started because of supposed burglary in the area, in the neighborhood, right? <sighs> now, it's one thing when, when people are involved, right? But if it's just stuff, let, let it be stuff. So anyway, we've been consistent on that on the, on the podcast for a long time. Stuff Forever. is just stuff. People are people. You know, we use deadly force to defend people. Uh, but if it's just stuff, man, you know, get good insurance, uh, or do a better job protecting your stuff by, and by that, I mean, not with a gun, I mean, keeping it secure. So anyway, uh, enough about that. And I, I, I don't intend to touch that issue for, for a while. Again, we've got to let a lot of things sort itself out. But we appreciate those of you uh, that have uh, followed us on the show and, and for your comments and also support. As I have received some messages from a few of you, uh, you know, saying positive things about the episode last week. Today's episode is brought to you and sponsored by Mountain Man Medical. MountainManMedical.com is the place. Uh, we've got a good supply and stock in store right here in the warehouse of Mountain Man Medical's uh, products. Uh, those ship, uh, uh, or we're shipping those orders now as they come in every day. So uh, super excited to be caught up on all orders, Mountain Man Medical related, for the time being. Uh, we still there's still some supply chain challenges because of coronavirus. Uh, one of our biggest suppliers uh, is really hampered right now because of the load that's been placed on them with demands from uh, uh, you know a lot bigger companies and hospitals and medical organizations than, than, you know, what we do as far as order volume. So, uh, but super excited to be, uh, shipping mountain man medical orders, uh, quickly and out the door. So check out mountainmanmedical.com for a trauma kit, for tourniquets, for quick clot, for refill kits, for, you know, all kinds of trauma kit oriented needs. And we hope to continue fleshing out the store with additional products down the line as well. So thanks for your support of mountainmanmedical.com, and it makes what we do here on the Concealed Carry podcast possible. And today's episode is also sponsored by Next Level Training's CERT Pistol. Uh, of course, we, you guys, if you're 
especially if you are longtime listeners of the podcast, you should be very familiar with the Sir Pistol because we've talked about it and used it and done stuff with it for a long time. Uh, but you can pick up your very own Sir Pistol today. And we have, I think, one of the most aggressively priced uh, sales on it anywhere in the industry for, uh, you know, for anybody to get, right? This is not the instructor discount or this, you know, we have just a good solid price on the cert pistols every day, all day long. Check it out. Concealedcarry.com forward slash cert S I R T. Uh, one thing you'll note when you go to that link right now, it only shows the Glock models, but you can navigate your way ba uh, back into the site and select. Uh, they also have SIG P320 options as well as the uh, uh, Smith & Wesson m and and the pocket pistol model, as it is called. So thanks for your support also of Next Level Training and the CERT pistol. Matthew, yes. that's our sponsors. What's the first story here? Okay, so uh, this column comes from Small Arm Analytics, and uh, they analyzed the um, the NYX checks and said, um, U.S. firearm sales, April 2020, unit sales continue drastic COVID-19-related increase. So they're up 71.3% uh, from April. This is the projected uh, NYX checks in uh, if you're not familiar with small, small arms analytics, they basically uh, try to whittle through the DOJ numbers and not all NICs necessarily mean uh, NICs checks. The, the, the system uh, necessarily means that it's a gun sale, but they go in a little deeper and they pull um, sales records and, and from different uh, places and weed out uh, different NICs checks. And so to try to get a truer number of the, the amount of firearms that were actually sold. And so um, this is uh, obviously a big increase from last month and uh, from last year at this time. Um, it's, uh, let's see, it's 83.1% firearms uh, uh, are up or hand, I'm sorry, handguns in uh, specifically and 70 or 51.7 uh, in long guns. So overall, it's a, up 74.6 uh, point, uh, over a year ago and 71.3 from April. Um, so showing that, you know, a lot of people are seeing what's going on with the government and overreach and stuff like that. So, um, you know. Yep. Yeah, so uh, uh, Ben asks, are we talking about checks mix? No, we're talking about the <laughs> Nix background check, which is the system that uh, is used for, for doing that, that the FBI uh, operates. And, I mean, the big thing is that we're still selling a lot of guns right now, especially handguns uh, throughout this whole coronavirus thing. I mean, as soon as coronavirus started get, popping up on people's radar, as soon as we started experiencing some – adjustments in society uh ammo started flying off the shelves guns started flying off the shelves and the, here's the thing that's i think pretty intriguing about this uh this article from smallarmsanalytics.com is that it says here that the ratio of handguns to long guns sold now stands at a new record of 1.94 breaking the previous high of 1.84 set just one month ago that's rather remarkable. And actually, that is quoting, it's it's within that article, but it's quoting from uh, uh, SAAF, that's smallarmsanalytics.com's uh, chief economist, Jurgen Brower. Uh, so here's what's remarkable about that. that. What that's saying is that for every one long gun sold, so rifle or shotgun, uh, 1.94, almost two handguns are sold. So handgun sales are basically double of long gun sales. And what that tells us is that, uh, you know, I, I think anyway, is it kind of gives us a, a little insight into the mindset of people, like what they're thinking, like what is the motivation behind making some of these purchases? Uh, you know, and I think a lot of people are thinking, wow, I see that our society could collapse and crash very quickly. Uh, you know, maybe we should uh, take some steps to to be ready for that or be prepared to defend ourselves if necessary. And so I think people, you know, the Americans' choice of self-defense firearm these days 
is a handgun. And I think out of the long guns that are being sold, probably a good chunk of those are Americans' choice for home defense, which is the AR-15 rifle. Yeah. So, And handguns, I mean, yeah. are necessarily more conducive to personal defense, right? Like you're saying. So I think a lot of these are not just collectors or just hunters or things like that. And uh, people that are probably maybe not gun owners prior to this, right? Like they might have taken this up as saying, hey, I've always wanted to uh, better be able to, you know, uh, protect myself. And now these things are kind of popping up and uh, now is the time to buy a handgun. And so uh, I think that's pretty interesting. Yep. Yep. All right. Let's go on now to uh, there's an update. Uh, from the NRA. And this is actually just found right on the competitions.nra.org page. That's the main page. You can go to that link anytime and and you'll have, you know, all these different options. And uh, it, the whole idea of that page is to get people funneled into competitions. And so uh, the NRA has announced that the 2020 NRA Precision Pistol Championships, which are scheduled for July 1 to the 5th, and also the 2020 NRA High Power Championships, which were scheduled in August, and the 2020 NRA Small Board Championships, all of those have been canceled, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, they say, of course, it's a difficult decision, uh, but uh, basically, the, I mean, there. This is a straight up cancellation, not that we're trying to reschedule these or move them on the calendar. Uh, just you know what? Sorry, it didn't work out this year. See you back in 2021. We're seeing uh, similar things from uh, competitions uh, in in other disciplines as well, and from other organizations. Uh, three gun competitions that are being canceled and or rescheduled. Uh, I know that the IDPA National Championship has been canceled, not just rescheduled, but canceled for 2020 as well. Uh, some of that was probably, you know, a bit of a of a political decision in that, uh, and and also the time frame. Uh, so the the 2020 IDPA National Championship was scheduled to happen here in Colorado. And Colorado has been a little bit more of an aggressive state as far as how it's handling COVID-19. So uh, basically their, their, their answer there was, you know, looking at things, looking at and talking with government authorities. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to hold the championships this year for IDPA. So very disappointing news there as well. Uh, and I was really excited to see a, a major national, you know, level uh, competition come to Colorado because we just don't see that that often. Uh, but uh, as of right now, it looks like USPSA is still kind of holding on, uh, planning as of right now at least to move forward with uh, their major uh, championships or area championships and the national championships. They did have to reschedule uh, the multi-gun one, I think it was, that I saw noted. But uh, the other championships come on come later in the year. I got a confirmation yesterday because I'm pl I'm planning on sh hopefully shooting the Area Three Championship USPSA, and uh, I, I sent them a message yesterday like, "Hey, is it still happening?" Uh, because that's in July, and uh, you know that's in Nebraska. So I was like, "I don't know," you know. And they did respond and say, "As of right now, the Area Three Championship is still a go." So. Clearly, COVID-19 is really upsetting, uh, you know, and I realize we're, this is like first world problems, right? We're talking about shooting competitions, but this is the Concealed Carry Podcast. This is a gun show, and, and we like our shooting competitions. At least I do. Are we? Are you back, Matthew? I think so. Is it audio better? Video? I just refreshed my page, right? uh, computer, so hopefully we'll yeah. I think your audio is still a little bit choppy like it was earlier, unfortunately. Huh. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll do the best we can with it. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Truthaboutguns.com reports America, Guns, and Freedom. That's actually the title of a, of a new book from author Miguel A. Faria, Jr., M.D., and uh, it says here that this book exposes the CDC's longtime anti-gun bias. Did you check this one out, Matthew? 
Yeah, it's it's interesting because you know we we talk a lot about um, end around methods of gun control, right? Like there's obviously the bills that magazine limit restrictions and bump stock bans and all these like different laws and or you know signed orders and how the DOJ does this and that. But then there's a there's kind of like a you know an end around backdoor way that over time, uh, gun rights have been under attack. And that's through, um, you know, basically, um, there was there was a, a real effort to not loan money through credit card companies to gun businesses. And then uh, certain businesses, you know, we wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, host them on their platform if they sold certain items. And so all these little back Backdoor ways of of limiting access to purchasing firearms and then taxing them, um, you know, taxing ammunition uh, super high so people can't actually buy ammunition. You have a firearm, but you're going to tax the, you know, the ammunition. So all these things. Um, and this this article talks about a book um, that shows that the CDC and and basically um, ha had been funded by the government to produce. Uh, I, I don't want to say overtly forced to produce anti-firearm uh, or gun um, or, or gun, uh, I guess, gun legislation, right? I don't want to say they were overtly forced, but it, it set up a, a situation where they were funding these these uh, uh, studies. And the, the idea was that favorable studies would get you more funding and and therefore, you kind of create a situation where these these uh, studies that were looking at gun violence and gun deaths and things like that, um, and the impact of more guns equals more crime or more guns equals um, you know f less crime, um, were, were skewed. They, they they were absolutely skewed. Um, and this, this book goes in depth and more than just, you know, the tinfoil hat, like, oh, this is what we think. And this is what we suppose is happening. But this, um, person is, was actually on the inside. Um, he's, uh, I, I believe it's, it goes in depth in the article and it kind of tells about the author, um, Faria, but, um, and, and what exactly he debunked and, and, and things like that. But, um, I, I believe uh, George Bush during uh, George W. Bush's term, uh, he was um, he was let me see he yeah he was given a position to reform the CDC standards, and so during that uh, he he kind of tried to yeah. clean up that uh, that whole mess and and that's if you hear now these people talking about well the federal government can't. Um, fund gun law or gun uh, uh, research, right? It's because they don't want to fund it in, in a way. It's not that they don't want any research done. It's that they don't want the federal government uh, kind of putting their finger on the scale one way or the other based on who's the president or what the, the you know, their policies are. So uh, to, to try to get that in these, uh, you know, studies to be done without any bias. And so um, it's a really interesting book. Uh, I haven't read it yet. I saw like a, they give you a little preview and you can read a couple pages. Uh, it's definitely something I'm going to, I'm going to get and, uh, and read and maybe I'll give you an update on how good it really is, but it seems like it's got a, a lot of good information. Yep. Uh, it looks like a great book, uh, you know, and, and there's some really great points made in this. I mean, you were talking about uh, how, uh, uh, well, it was actually Congress in 1996 that passed a law, a bill, a, a bipartisan-supported bill uh, that nixed uh, funding to the CDC for gun re research, essentially. And I know that's been a controversial issue uh, that a lot of times the anti-gunners now and their their respective organizations have tried to throw at us and, and, and use uh, as, a, as a talking point. Um, but you know, this, this just goes back, this book goes, it goes in depth too, to show why a lot of that came, came about, you know, why we've had to nix funding for that kind of study, you know, for that kind of research, because it was being done in a biased way. I mean, here, here's the bigger thing we, we've seen in recent history, evidence of scientists. And I know that it, it's kind of like attorneys and, uh, 
uh, even, you know, gun carriers, you know, there, there's a few bad apples that uh, make a mess for everybody else that spoil the bunch. Uh, and, and I, I'm sure by and large, uh, scientists take their jobs seriously. Uh, and researchers, you know, want to do a good job and have as little bias as possible, uh, put together the best uh, information and collection of data and statistics. But, you know, humans are humans and humans are going to human. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, th there's just, you know, it's just, it's just a fact of life and that sometimes uh, personal beliefs and biases uh, are going to enter the picture and, uh, you know, get in the way of things. So uh, it's important, I think, that we recognize where these biases exist. I also think it's important to understand why I think it's uh, it's inherently dangerous to have a government organization studying issues like guns and gun control, uh, where that's already such a politically charging issue, but also you know, we're talking about a Second Amendment fundamental right secured in the Constitution. And if you have government doing something or studying something in a way that might be used as a tool to restrict that right, that, that just doesn't sit very well with me. So it's really important that we recognize bias where we see bias, that we try to shut it down where we can, and especially in the context of so-called government research, uh, it just can't fly. Yeah. Next up. It, it, uh, I mean, oh, go ahead. No, I, I was just saying, is my audio back okay? I, I don't know. I'm trying to refresh stuff, and I hope it's getting better. Oh. I think it's a little choppy still, but uh, we'll, we'll make do. All righty. Hopefully our listeners will forgive us. And for those <laughs> watching the video stream, uh, Graybeard here is just going to be pixelated. <laughs> it's better. It for is you what guys. it is. <laughs> Actually, it's better for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got an article here from firearmsnews.com about the the Lauga or Laugo Arms Alien pistol. Uh, the title of the article is "At First Glance: Laugo Arms Alien." Uh, this is getting a lot of attention more now because it was featured at shot show specifically. It was featured at the industry day at the range portion of the show. Uh, so people actually, for a lot of people is their first opportunity to get their hands on this crazy looking thing and, uh, uh, and shoot it. And I, I had that opportunity and, and pleasure as well. Uh, I think Matthew, you did as well. I didn't, I didn't get down there. I don't know how I missed it, but I missed it. So gotcha. Well, you did yeah. miss it. You know, it, it, it's, if anything, it's just such a unique handgun. I mean, it, folks that are familiar with the, uh, uh, the Rhino, you know, revolver. Yeah. Right. That is, you know, where the barrel is basically flipped from where it's supposed to be so that the rounds are firing from the bottom of this, of the cylinder, as opposed to the top of the cylinder. It's kind of like, like the alien pistol is the semi-automatic version of that. You know, the, the barrel is, sits really down low in a crazy location. It, it seems completely and wholly unnatural. Uh, it, it, the whole idea here is you're putting the barrel pretty much in line with where the the fulcrum, I talk about this, you know, when I'm talking about grip, the the webbing of your hand, the top of, of that, where it makes contact with the beaver tail on the pistol, that's that's the fulcrum point where a handgun tries to essentially twist in your hands as it's recoiling from being fired. And so the idea here is that you place that barrel in line so that you have basically zero bore axis, right? There, there's no height over the hand. There's no bore over height uh, over the hand that is going to try to torque that. Now, the reality is, you have a reciprocating slide. Even in the case of Alien, you still have a reciprocating slide that has to move. Uh, that That's part of, you know, semi-automatic pistol until somebody figures out a different way of doing it uh, and making it work and work reliably. Uh, that's just, just a, a fact of life. You got to have something that moves and reciprocates and, you know, pulls rounds out of a chamber and slams the next round back in. And so that reciprocating mass still is going to sit above your hand and it's still going to have a, some effect. 
but the alien shot incredibly flat for a pistol for semi-automatic and uh, i enjoyed shooting it it's it's a it's you, you could tell it's well designed and well well made as far as there's there's a lot of thought that went into this thing and it, and it looks kind of crazy and cool i think you know some people probably think it looks ugly uh i just i have respect for innovation and doing things different so i think it looks cool you know on on that point uh now they you could tell that they've worked really hard to minimize the recip- the the mass that's reciprocating in the slide and there's a couple other things too that is unique about the alien pistol in that uh you can see and there's an image here in this article on firearmsnews.com where you see it has a red dot mounted which is you know kind of the the new big thing as well red dots on pistols and uh that the option here is is that you can either have that red dot mounted to the slide that's reciprocating, which is just like any other red dot mounted uh, pistol. Or there's an option to also have a mount, a version of this gun, where the red dot is mounted to a part of the upper portion of the gun that does not reciprocate. So it'd be similar in practice to like an open division uh, pistol, you know, like an open division 2011 that a lot of times are, are shot in a uh, USPSA uh, open division where that, that optic is basically mounted to the frame of the gun. Mm-hmm. So it's a really interesting and unique design. I, that's all I'll say about it. And I enjoyed shooting it. Now the price is a bit hefty. <laughs> Did you see the price on this thing, Matthew? Yeah, it, 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 I'll I'll let you guys know it's five grand. So I'll never own one, but maybe <laughs> next year I'll shoot one. <laughs> it, it's five grand, um, but very cool, very cool gun. Yeah, yeah I think it is. Uh, I think it is. Uh, yeah, I think uh, somebody asked about. Um, I think David, yeah, asked about is it available to to consumers? I, I believe they they are yeah. selling it now. So. Yeah, the, the, the big thing here is that uh, Laogo Arms had to uh, get on board with a uh, an importer here in the United States because Laogo Arms is based in Czechoslovakia, and uh, they got on board with – I'm trying to think. I'm actually researching it really quick to um, – hold on. I think it's – is it Lancer? Maybe. I think it might be Lancer. At least that's that's uh, this is where my search has taken me is to a to a page on Lancer Systems website. Uh, so basically, they they had to get you know they had to find a way to because uh, there's all kinds of import regulations and things you have to work around. And most companies choose to work with an importer where the gun is made out of out of the United States, and then the importer, which is based here in the states, is going to go through and jump through all the hoops to get that gun imported and brought into the United States. So it is coming to the States. I don't know if they've got them out to market yet here uh, or if they're you know, actually being sold and seen out in the wild here in the United States or not yet. Uh, but I suspect that'll be happening very soon. Uh, now the gun is, it's really geared around competition. That's, that's pretty much why this thing exists. I mean, someone could use it for a defensive gun, I suppose, but again, it's a $5,000 gun, right? <laughs> Which right. honestly is on par with, you know, a lot of your high end open division type guns. So, or even limited division guns. So it's not, I mean, it seems kind of crazy to some, to some of us. Uh, I certainly will not be affording one anytime soon, but I, like I said, I appreciate the innovation and and what it brings and what it has to offer for the industry. So it's a pretty, pretty cool thing. For sure. And I'm disappointed you didn't get to shoot it, buddy. Me too. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) So tell us about this. This is, I think, our last story. Uh, the post and courier dot com. Uh, Columbia man arrested with ninety firearms had researched mass shootings. Prosecutors say. Yeah, this, this was a pretty crazy one. So um, I'll, I'll give you the lowdown. A twenty-five year old Columbia college student has been arrested after federal agents said they discovered he had fraudulently obtained dozens of firearms and more than twenty-three hundred rounds of ammunition. Um, the man, uh, federal prosecutor said on Wednesday also had researched mass shootings on his computer. So basically what this guy did was, um, he would go to an FFL, he'd have a gun shipped there, um, pay with a credit card, take the gun home and then challenge that, uh, that, 
uh, charge on his uh, credit card with his bank. And then they would refund him the money. He said, I didn't do it I, or I didn't, you know, buy that gun. Um, and he did this like, I, I don't know how many times, but I, I believe in the, in the, it doesn't say how many um, times he did it, but he, he had when they found him, he had 90 firearms, which for me, it's a lot for you guys that collect firearms, probably not much, um, but that's a lot of firearms. I don't know how many, like he said, he got through this, you know, false way of uh, a fraud, you know, uh, basically fraud by tricking the, the uh, credit card companies or his banks to, to refund him the money. Uh, he had 2,300 rounds of ammunition, which that's not an, a, a, a ton of ammunition, but, um, and it says he had five bump stocks, um, along with firearm scopes, tactical helmets, and, and uh, other gear, gas masks, gas mask filters, and body armor. Um, so, th you know, that on its own, you know, if you have all that stuff, not a big deal. But this guy was also um, researching. It said they found that he had searched the Internet three times for the firearms used in the Santa Fe school shooting, one time for the shooter, and two times for gas mask shooting. He also appeared to have visited websites with content about mass shootings in Charleston and Florence. Um, and so this guy probably wasn't all right in the head. Uh, he was doing some some bad stuff as far as, you know, fraud with the uh, credit cards. But, you know, I, I think they also hammered him because um, he obtained these these guns illegally, basically, right, through some sort of um, uh, illegal scheme. So all kinds of charges. For yeah. Him, dude. Yeah. You know, it's a little. uh it's definitely suspect. You know, it, the the article seems to imply that part of this scheme was also how he uh, that this scheme was how he obtained some of these weapons, how these these firearms. So that's definitely suspect, right? Because uh, you know the idea of using, say, PayPal or something to order something and pay for something, but then claiming you didn't receive the item, so you can then claim it uh right. through that whole uh claims process that you know companies like paypal has you know then how are clearly if, if somebody's selling these guns and they're doing online payments like that and shipping it or whatever then clearly those you know there there, there are laws being violated here so that that's a problem um as for the ammo and and things like that and of course paypal also doesn't you know allow payment and sales and stuff of ammunition and other and a whole bunch of other things too. But not that, that was the only uh, platform that he used for payment, but that's probably the big one. And they had the most robust program for protecting buyers, uh, which is where this type of thing can really be easily abused. Uh, so I find that all very curious, but uh, the, the thing is that really what this comes down to is this is a crime where a guy uh, stole from other people and he used the mail and stuff to do so. That's, that's what he's been charged with, right? Uh, is with, uh, what was the actual, see, federal wire fraud and mail fraud, right? So, and then position of machine gun violations. <laughs> well, we'll have to see what comes out of that one. But when they start talking about how he has all these guns and 23,000 rounds of ammunition, that's where I start getting kind of like, come on, like that's, that's, that in of itself is not illegal. Now, if he obtained those things illegally, or the weapons themselves were were illegal, meaning if if it was you know it seems to imply there were some machine gun violations, so he may have had some uh, class three or or, or NFA uh, restricted items that were not properly uh, transferred, you know, with the right pipe paperwork and uh, tax stamps and everything involved, but. Um, 23,000 rounds of ammo. Well, I know some guys that would look at 23,000 rounds of ammo and go, well, that's rookie numbers, bro. Like, <laughs> got to get those numbers up, you know? So so that's where I think we have to be real about this. At the end of the day, this guy was breaking the law and, and ripping people off. Uh, but was he about to become the next mass shooter? I don't know. You know, it, it seems suspect, right? Certainly if someone's willing to go through the effort of – let's you know rip a bunch of people off and steal stuff well then he's already morally uh, uh dubious and suspect so he's probably more likely to to be willing to go kill people and and the research itself i mean seems to lend you know it seems to give credence to that 
That said, I research all those same things. <laughs> you see where I'm coming from? I'm like, yeah. I have a lot of ammo. I have guns. I research this stuff, mostly in the context of you know my profession and doing the podcast and stuff. But you know, it it, it gives me kind of the heebie-jeebies to think that one day there could be an article out there with my name in it because for some reason the feds decided to come after me and you know and 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 it would read the same way riley had all these rounds of ammo <laughs> and all these guns and he researched mass shootings <laughs> now what what i might do that would break the law i uh, you know <laughs> that's beyond me i'm not saying i'm planning anything okay this got really off uh way off track here <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you see, maybe maybe with this guy's other like what he was doing. Obviously, you mentioned it. Um, if you're if you're involved in the scheme of stealing stuff, you're probably not, you know, researching it for a podcast, right? To to educate people, you're probably <laughs> trying to do some nefarious stuff. So, um, right, yeah. you're good. <laughs> you know, it just comes down to that. Like all a lot of those things, you know, in and of themselves, is not illegal at all right? Like there's nothing wrong with researching and buying ammo and buying guns, uh, provided you're not buying them illegally, but uh, you start putting it all together. And that's definitely, you know, it's, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you know, looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, must be a duck, right? So uh, anyway, sounds like either way, they took care of a bad guy. Because I'll tell you what, I have been ripped off of, or I've been ripped off in online purchases that involved, yes, a, tr a, a firearm, actually, uh, one that was purchased through GunBroker. And uh, mm -hmm. just to give you the, the quick, you know, down and dirty is that I bought something that was portrayed as being a lot better and higher quality than it actually was. And when trying to get recourse on that and get that resolved, uh, what I learned, at least that's how it worked then, and I don't know if that's still how it operates, but there was extremely, there was almost nothing uh, in terms of buyer protection through gun broker. There was, there was no way for me to get it resolved. So I had to, I overpaid for a very cheap and low quality gun and was not very happy about it. So it was a AR-15. The purchase was done legally. But the guy selling it, oh, dirty dog. Anyway, uh, so moving on now to gear reviews. I guess I'll go first. I think the last time we did it, oh, we lost Matthew, I see, now as well. So hopefully Matthew comes back. So I'll get into my review. Uh, my, I'm actually going to talk about two things. One is a is a true review. The other thing is going to be kind of a preview of a, re of a review that I'm going to do. And so my first item, I am actually wearing it. And this is the Henry Holsters. Let me see if I can get it over my over my head and neck. Oops, I just dropped my, my earbud. This is the Henry Holsters uh, OCD, it's called. All right. And what it is is a... See that? It is... Okay, so for those of you listening to the audio only, this is a Purell one-ounce... A uh, hand sanitizer uh, bottle holder. It's a, it's basically a dispenser, but it, it's really you know cleverly designed. Uh, it's just a Kydex shell that holds a one ounce bottle of Purell, and with a piece of uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Rip? Uh, no. What I, I I've had a. You have to understand. We have a technical difficulty. Matthew disappeared. I'm monitoring all this stuff on my screen, trying to watch for him to come back. And uh, that messes with my ability to communicate in a rational and logical fashion and get words out of my mouth. So thank you for bearing with me. Uh, paracord. There we go. <laughs> 550 paracord. So we have a little necklace goes basically uh, that goes to the uh, OCD and throws around your neck. This has been a lifesaver for me during this whole, whole coronavirus deal. Uh, I wear this with me pretty much everywhere I go these days. Uh, this was actually given to me by uh, Andrew Henry over at Henry Holsters. And he's a good dude and makes a quality product. Uh, and I was thrilled to get one of these in my hands and wear it at SHOT Show and everywhere I went so that in my meetings and stuff at SHOT Show, 
I could get done, shake hands, uh, throw some uh, Purell on, offer it to others if I wanted. Uh, the, one of the clever things about how he designed this, just so you know, because it may not be obvious, is on the back side. So on the front side, has got his little, it's not really a logo, but it has Henry Holsters uh, engraved in the front of the OCD uh, thing here. And then on the back, there's a cutout. And that's really smartly done because while this is, this thing just, you know, pressure fits into the OCD. The Purell bottle just, just snaps in there. And now Kydex being what it is and being rigid like it is, if, if that was the case and you didn't have this cut out on the back, you would not be able to actually dispense this very well because you wouldn't be able to push the bottle to dispense the uh, Purell, the hand sanitizer. So really well done, Andrew and team at Henry Holsters. You can pick up your own uh, Henry Holsters OCD, uh, highly recommended product, I think. Now he sells it. He doesn't include the Purell with it. Uh, so hopefully you can get a hold of some of that for, uh, out of your stash or wherever. So you can, uh, get a bottle to use with your new Henry holsters OCD. And that's, so that's the first thing I'm, I'm reviewing here today. looks like Matthew is back in the, uh, in the green room. Uh, and I'll, I'll bring him back on camera here in just a moment because I'm going to hog the spotlight. So, uh, Henry Holster's OCD is the first thing I told you I was going to talk about. The second thing is I just received this today. This showed up in the mail, and I'm super excited. This is a book from Gary Quasenberry, who is a federal air marshal and was on uh, History Channel's Top Shot show, the TV show many of you are familiar with. He was on there twice, uh, once as a you know, first time competitor. And then he came back for their all stars season where they competed against other previously non winning competitors. Uh, and both times Gary, I think finished second, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And so, uh, really awesome shooter, uh, good dude. He's really down to earth, really humble, uh, and works really hard to keep our planes and skies safe as a federal air marshal. He wrote the book spotting danger before it spots you. And he's drawn upon his experience, his training, and all the, you know, a couple of decades, I think now of, of flying in the skies and doing his best to spot things that are a little bit out of place, uh, things that aren't quite right with people, uh, whatever it is looking for those, those, those cues, those indicators, uh, pre pre attack or planning uh, uh, type uh, cues, and so it looks to be a fantastic book. Gary's actually talked with me a little bit a little bit about it uh, in, in the past, you know, number of months. Kind of, you know, just hey, you know, I'm writing this book, and this is kind of the, the 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 concept behind it. But it is now actually out. It is in print. Uh, you can pick up a copy. The link will be in the show notes as well as the link for the Henry Holsters OCD. Uh, so check out the book, Spotting Danger Before It Spots You and Henry Holsters OCD. And we now bring back Matthew Marister, who cool. hopefully got his uh, computer stuff working better. <laughs> yeah, I hope. I could I could hear you fine. Like I restarted everything, so hopefully it helps. But uh but yeah, Gary, I, I just want to add in, Gary is an awesome guy. If you guys are familiar with the Q-Series holster, he's the one who designed that. But uh, I got a chance to interview him a couple of times, and, and he's just a really funny, down-to-earth guy. So um, yeah, you'll have to tell me how that book, how that book is. Uh, I'm excited. I think he wrote another book, didn't he? Or maybe this is his first one. I'm not sure. Um I, maybe he was, I don't recall. You know what? He We talked about it. He was working on it, and that's why... Um, I yeah. it's jogging my memory. So, yep. Yep. Well, this, this is it, man. That's the book. <laughs> so I'm excited to read it and I'll, I'll report back once I get through it. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, it looks, it's definitely digestible. It's, uh, a little more than a hundred pages. It's a hundred and if we take out the, there's, there's kind of a self-assessment appendix. Like there's some questions and things you can ask in the back and, and write some of your answers down some, some stuff to kind of inspire you to, to, think through some th stuff some, to plan some things uh to to have you know a plan in place essentially um but uh yeah it's basically 130 pages so very digestible mm -hmm. uh, not too long but it's it looks like it's well done it's a, it's a quality book he, it's a nice print so uh good job there cool. gary and we'll report back once i get through it very cool um, and I know that, that for everyone on this watching the podcast, uh, you're probably not going to be able to see this because I don't think my video improved at all. Um, but I have here the RMR 
or the RMSC from Shield Sites. Uh, it's mounted here on my P365. You can see it right there. Um, I've been using this for, oh boy, uh, maybe six, seven, eight months now. Um, no, not that, maybe about five months. Um, and I'm really impressed with it. It, it, it you know, for a small little uh, reflex site, it's it's very the the screen or the uh, window is very easy to see through. Uh, it is a glass uh, quartz coated um, or glass coated lens. It's they're old. Uh, I think their their old RMSC had a polymer lens. This is now glass. They have a bunch of different uh, models. Uh, Shield Sites does. Um, this, like I said, is the RMSC. Um, there, it's a, it's an adjustable or auto adjustable. Um, uh, reticle uh, as far as the brightness so that's it, whether you like that or not that's uh, that's how it is so um, that's I, I've been impressed with the uh, quickness of of how it adjusts and uh, it's 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 actually pretty bright I was kind of concerned um, with the auto adjusting feature um, but it seems to work really well um, it gets bright when it needs to. Like in daylight, I can see the dot pretty easily um, without without a problem. Um, the adjustments you need a little a, like a little windage wheel with the Allen key that you put in the side. So that's kind of uh, kind of like one of the downsides of it. It, it. There's no adjustments that you uh, can make on the 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 site itself or the optic itself without that little tool um, but once you have the tool if you have the tool it's it's simple to use it's just you need the tool um, also if you want to replace the battery um, you have to remove it from from the gun that's uh, a downside with with this thing being so small there's no way that they could have a battery tray that you could take out the battery so that's kind of a downside kind of a bummer um, the there is no on and off it's constant run but um, this battery has been in there for like I said about five months now and uh, it, it's it's running fine so um, overall I'm, I'm impressed with the with the size and, and um, it's you know it's functioning pretty well I haven't beaten it up it is made of aluminum so it's probably not something that you would put on like a uh, you probably wouldn't carry a, a, a you know micro compact for duty anyways um, but um, it's probably not something that I would abuse you know start racking it on you know barricades or the concrete blocks and stuff like that uh, but it looks like um, from what I could tell uh, just you know using it uh, that the the glass is far enough back behind the shroud of the uh, optic where it's not the glass isn't necessarily going to come into contact with whatever you're putting that up against. So, um, but pretty cool. It's uh, it's waterproof or water resistant. So um, it seems like a pretty good good optic if if you're in for uh, an optic for say your uh, Hellcat or your Glock 43 P365 something like that. So that's the RMSC from Shield Sites. They got a bunch of different options on their on the, on their page, depending on um, what you want, different reticle types and sizes and shapes and all kinds of stuff. Nice man. Uh, so I've got one as well uh, that uh, is actually mounted onto a, a Springfield Hellcat pistol that I'm still trying to work through and get my review on that done. I uh, just haven't been able to get to the range, you know, obviously with uh, everything going on uh, as much as I'd like and, and be able to run it some more through its paces. Uh, now, you know, the thing is, you know, the RMSC has been around for a while. Uh, you know, the previous iterations of the, of the RMS uh, series of red dot sites, uh, things like uh, the J uh, uh, J point is actually one of the names is known at known as for a long time ago or something like doctor doctor sites or something like that if i'm not mistaken some that rings a bell um that's going back a ways i don't think i've heard it referred to i think it's all still the same company uh or they've been bought and acquired and you know changed names and rebranded but uh, th these sites have been around these red dots have been around a long time uh, and i do think that they've gotten better uh so you know it's a good little little 
a good little optic for what it is. Very, very compact. Not as strong, though, it would seem, as the new Hollow Sun that's coming along here hopefully soon. Those still yeah. have yet to officially hit stores, I believe. So I've been watching uh, one of my online sources to see when those uh, show up. Hopefully, supposedly, Hollow Sun said they were going to send one, too, but I haven't have yet to see that. So uh be interesting to compare that new Hollow Sun 507 uh is that, is that what it is? 507? 507K, I think. Yeah, 507K. Thank you. I knew I was missing uh, part of it. I'm like, wait, there is a 507. The K <laughs> model is the is is, is that the designation timer. that it's... Uh, yeah, I'm having a hard time talking today. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, it's just one of those days. So, you know, it'd be better if Matthew got his stinking internet working. Yeah, I'm going to have to work on that. <laughs> um. One question I did want to ask you about that RMSC is, uh, you know, I'm glad you touched on a couple of things like how you got to have like their little tool and stuff to make adjustments, accurate adjustments, stuff like that. Um, obviously, it's pretty lightweight and and not super robust, you know, mm-hmm. structurally. Like if you drop it, it's probably gonna probably gonna break. Um, but I actually wanted to ask you, Matthew, what your thoughts are after you've been playing with the auto dimming feature, right? Where it just it dims based on the light in your environment what are your thoughts on that yeah so I, I mentioned it's kind of it was kind of a concern um because you could be in a situation where you're actually under let's say you're under inside a building or uh, under a canopy that's dark but your target is much brighter right and so you could get into a situation where it thinks you're in a dark low light situation so it dims the dot but your uh target is is you know, blown out by a ton of light. Um, yeah. I haven't, I, you know, and, and I tried to replicate that by, you know, standing in, in a room, a uh, dark room and kind of pointing out across the hallway um, at a target. And I, I found that it, it's pretty bright. I mean, even at the low level, I haven't had an issue. Um, at least I haven't been able to replicate it, it outside um necessarily um where i had a situation where it was so bright my target was so bright that i couldn't see the dot um well let me I, let me I'm ask you a little more sp- could happen let me ask you more specifically about that is it is it about seeing or not being able to see the dot or is it that i mean can is the dot bright enough that it's easy to find and easy to see including when shooting fast Right. And I think that's, I think that would be the question. Um, I, in here's, this is why I have another, I have that uh, Vortex uh, Viper Venom, not sure. I think it's a Venom. Um, and I never put it on the auto adjust just because um, I think even at, at low level or in a, you know, a low light situation, even on the upright setting, it, that the dot doesn't really blare out my whole screen where I wouldn't be able to really see my target behind the dot. So I kind of err on the side of caution and dial it up a little higher because if I'm outside, I definitely want to be able to see the dot clearly um, where I'm not seeing just kind of a, a glow that I can't really make out. So I think in like you're saying in a situation, it might be difficult to make more of a, uh, high precision shot because that dot wouldn't be as clear. I think is what I'm trying to say, but I think in a self defense context, maybe uh, you know self defense distance, maybe ten yards and in, I think that you would be able to see that dot enough where you could put it center mast on a on a human size target and and get acceptable hits. But as an accurate shot um, in a situation where your dot is dimmed in the target is bright or you're using a uh hand a handheld light or a weapon mounted light where it's blow, you know blowing out that the 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 color on that uh target and it's just uh-huh. completely white you might you might have an issue yep yep i don't know well, if you that, found the same thing or or not yeah i mean for me I, I the thing that is most important to me when i'm running a pistol is fat you know being able to quickly pick up whatever my aiming devices whether it's a front mm-hmm. sight whether it's the red dot and so what i have found on red dots is i want them brighter than probably is comfortable to look at a lot of times 
right? People complain about like if you get blooming or kind of a starburst or whatever uh, of of the red dot itself. Um, yeah, that's not ideal, but I'd rather have that than one that I can't see hardly at all, or I can't mm-hmm. or I can't pick it up very fast when I, you know in faster strings of fire. You know the the way to run a red dot. And, and, you know, just from my experience, and I actually heard it described as this on the Steve Anderson podcast, uh, talk, talking about painting your target. So think of that as a, as a brush stroke when that red dot is, you know, when the gun is cycling and the slide is cycling and things are jumping around. And what you want to see is, is that red dot kind of lift up and then come back down and treat that as, a, as more of a paintbrush rather than, you know, trying to find this dot. And if you if your dot is dim or not really, really high contrast compared to your target, then it's really hard to pick that up and find that paintbrush and be able to shoot, you know, quickly. That's pretty much what it comes down to for me. And I think the same way of of front sights on on pistols as well. Uh, you know, comment here a question from Mark about uh, what's a good night sight that will work with an RMR. And my response, I typed it out, but honestly, right now, if I was sitting up a new pistol with a, a, a red dot on it, plus uh, backup irons, I would go blacked out rear iron sight, and I'd go probably a, fr- a fiber optic front sight. And I would, I would just buy them from Dawson. Dawson is, is a good company that, you know, makes and has all kinds of options, all kinds of different heights. So you can find out what height you need to make it work, you know, so that you get that, op, that, uh, iron sight where you want it. You know, I, I want it just over the top edge of the, of the optic itself. You know, I don't want it necessarily in my, my window too much. I just, I need enough to where I can fall back to it and use it if I need to. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm using the dot and, uh, you know, other red dot op- or other night sight options are out there for sure. But, when you start getting into like tritium night sights and stuff, you start finding far fewer options and less ability to customize the height you need to, to, to get the one that works for your setup. Uh, and, and you'll see more and more guys are running either blacked out sights front and rear or front fiber optic and a blacked out rear. The idea is that you should be using light and identifying your target anyway. Right. Exactly. Which means you're going to have those sights. You're going to be able to see those sights. Right. So, so the tritium night sight part of the, of that, you know, that feature is not as much of a need as it is having a good sight that also has good contrast for when I need it uh, to enable me to perform at my best when under stress. So anyway, good, good stuff. That's good review, man, on the RMSC. So, so thanks for bringing that uh, to our attention, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good conversation too, a little bit there on red dots. So before we let everybody go, I do want to remind you all that today's uh, uh, podcast uh, is sponsored by the CERT pistol from Next Level Training, concealedcarry.com forward slash CERT, S-I-R-T is the place to go, and also mountainmanmedical.com. And now we can get to our giveaway. Do you have the giveaway ready, Matthew, to uh, award the prize? I can pull it up right as we speak. He's on it. So <laughs> while I distract everybody mm-hmm. uh, momentarily, this week we are announcing a winner for a copy of Legal Boundaries by State. This is our, our Legal Boundaries by State uh, 50 State Guide to Firearm Carry uh, Law, essentially, in all 50 states. With a whole bunch, it's you know, it's basically the book is half state by state by state by state comparison, and then about the other half, about fifty pages or so, is just good, helpful information about traveling with a firearm, storage of a firearm, hotels, uh, restaurants and bars, uh, air travel, you know, all those things that you know you all want to know about how to properly package or store or transport your firearm when you're traveling various places. The big question we get asked all the time is about, you know, flying with a gun and how that goes. Well, there's, there's a whole segment dedicated in that book all about that. So the legal boundaries by state, of course, always available on our website at concealedcarry.com. Today we're giving somebody, a lucky somebody, a free copy. I believe this is for the ebook version. So we have two, two versions. You have an ebook and we have a paper copy. And the ebook is a lifetime, essentially a lifetime license. You can always uh, get the updated version uh, and download it for your for your review. Okay, uh, the paper version we update 
as often as we are able to as we learn that laws change, yes. which is, you know, probably three times a year or so that, that, that we're doing updates. I would I would guess right now. So, uh, Matthew, have you got it pulled up? Are you ready? I do. Are you guys so, ready? One lucky winner going to get a copy of the Legal Boundaries by State Book. All right. So, Y'all ready? Here's drum roll. <laughs> All right. First name is Sean and last name is MC something. MC so, Hammer? Not MC Hammer. No. <laughs> <laughs> is MC <laughs> Hammer's first name Sean? <laughs> <laughs> Big M, little C. Oh, okay. Know. Gotcha. <laughs> but uh, congratulations, Sean. Nice. Congrats, Sean, on winning the Legal Boundaries by State book. And then next week's giveaway is for uh, ice cube tray. That's right. It took me a second to remember. So we have these silly little uh, ice cube trays, in, you know, that are in the shape of cartridges, bullets. Uh, and uh, so somebody's gonna win one of these ice cube trays for you to enjoy. You know, we're getting close here to the to the warmer months. Some of you are already in parts of the country that are already quite warm. So as you want to sit down on the front porch or the veranda or the back deck or whatever and kick back with an ice cold drink well you can use these nifty little bullet shaped ice cubes to put in your drink so that's the giveaway for next week's podcast prize and of course you can sign up each week for the giveaway at concealedcarry.com forward slash podcast prize absolutely and so with that, that's a wrap. It is time to bid you all adieu. And until next time, we remind you, right? The usual saying, train right, train often, and train safe. So you can fight hard, fight fast, and fight true. Take care. <laughs> Take a whole new meaning to getting iced. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you guys are awesome. Thanks for being with us and uh, for putting up with the ah, the controls here <laughs> and my lack of being able to run things and talk intelligently. David and Elkie and Casey and Tony and Ben, Mark, uh, other Mark. Uh, I think I said David. This is just one last shout out, guys. Thank you so much, Matthew. You guys are awesome. So take care and be safe, and we'll see you next time.